Welcome to today's virtual Lunch and Learn Summer Series. I am so excited to be interviewing the one and only Jim Kramer today. Um, and we'll be talking all about his career and his background. So with that, we're going to switch over to Jim. Jim, thank you so much for doing this. I'm so excited between, you know, it's hard because I've done a lot of interviews with people for this series over the summer. And between your background in finance and law and journalism and, and you know, media and, and just so much you've done. So I don't even know where to start, but thank you for doing this. Well, first, let me say, Liz, that uh, yesterday I interviewed uh, Ben Odor, one of my absolute favorite CEOs, perhaps the uh, top 10 performing CEOs in America from Clorox. And uh, he retired yesterday. And when, he, when our camera ends and we get to talk personally, which I always do, uh, I said, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I want to do uh, some inspirational things. I want to help. I want to do something. That, I don't know if you know this series. And he mentioned you. And I said, holy cow, I'm doing it tomorrow. And he said, well, that will be good because young people need to hear from us in a non-cynical way where we explain things. And I thought the coincidence was just serendipitous and fabulous. So I'm thrilled to be here. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that story. That's great. Um, so I have so many questions about your career, how you got your breaks. I really want to ask you about something new that I heard about online about a mask initiative you're, uh, you know, right now spearheading. But before we get into that, most people are watching, who are watching are in college. And I think a lot of them want to know, what was Jim like in college? Like, were you a big partier? Were you a library guy? Tell us about what you were like at Harvard. Okay. I did not know what I was like at Harvard until after I graduated. And I say that because, and this is, I'm at the point in my career where I can be as candid as, um, I, I don't play for dinner is the term they use in the NFL. Uh, but I realize now that I was frighteningly bipolar. And let me explain why. Because I realized I was a competitive guy I went to a school that had never sent anybody to Harvard. Uh, I felt very overmatched. And so what I realized is that I needed more time than everybody else. So I made a decision not to sleep on Tuesdays, that I would just stay up and just do it. And then by sophomore year, I didn't go to bed on Thursdays. So I would you know, go Monday and then I'd you know, go to bed around 11 and get up around three. And then Tuesday, I wouldn't go to sleep. And then Thursday, I wouldn't go to sleep. And that's what allowed me to catch up to all the fancy prep school guys and gals who knew far more than I did. That was my edge. My edge was no sleep. In retrospect, I now realize that not everybody can can't do that. And as my wife, Lisa, said, was it not obvious to you that you were mentally ill? And I said, well, whatever it did, it, it made it so I got magna cum laude, and I was also able to be editor of the Crimson. And, uh, and we always laugh about it now, because I think the secret of my success and how I was able to be editor of the Crimson and do well was because I just decided that sleep was a complete waste of time. You know, it's funny. I'm not a big uh, sleeper myself, and a lot of people poke fun. But are you one of the people who have the gene where you don't need to sleep and you can yeah, still be healthy? I, I, you... okay. no, I mean, last night, there was a bad storm. And so I slept from, I went to bed at 11.30. I slept until uh, 2. And then my trainer comes at 3.30. Uh, because you, I need, at this time, I have to have a couple hours to be able to really stay in shape. So I have a kind of a, I do go to sleep though. Now in 2017, I reverted to my old schedule and my body could not handle it. And that was very disappointing to me. Uh, I, I think that's a once in a lifetime thing at college. And at college, I was also, um, there were things that I did that I, that candidly um, were fully port, I fully port take, I, I port talk in um in campus social life how's that uh, very social okay. and um extremely so so i did that uh and i love to write and that's where i learned to write uh thousands of words a day and i write about seven thousand words a day for uh for mad money uh stater i you know, loved being a reporter uh and covered sports i was the first guy ever to come up from the sports side i went out for track i had been a a really, really good runner. 
but I couldn't do less than what was at that point a 49 quarter and I got cut. But the coach said, why don't you write, uh, why don't you write about track? And I worked my way up to be editor and it was a very thrilling thing to do, but I didn't get my diploma. I, uh, on the day of, I, right before I graduated, a member of the faculty called me and said that there was another member of the faculty that had lied at a faculty meeting about keeping a particular division uh, called history and literature closed because he said he wanted, he, he wanted to be able to make it so that uh, they already had a huge teacher student ratio and he wanted to keep it lower. Uh, and at the end of it, when no one was looking, he said to my friend, I, I have the best teacher student ratio. I just lied to all of them. They're such a bunch of idiots. It's just so easy. So this friend called me and said, yep, you can do it. You can write about this because you're about to graduate. Oh my you're graduate God. in two days. Unfortunately, the man I wrote about was able somehow to get involved in the diploma process and they withheld my diploma. So I got my diploma two months later and apology from the president of the school. But my parents were uh, somewhat uh, maligned because I went down the line to get it and there was the guy who I wrote the article about and I shook, I took, put my hand out and he waved me off the stage and said, I hope you want to come to, I hope you come to me for recommendation because I won't give you one. And that was the last thing that happened at Harvard. Wow, that is wild. This okay, point, so. My mom was hurt. That's, yeah, I, I mean, well, karma, you know, I, I believe I in karma. I don't talk about so. it much because uh, it was something to get the diploma two months later uh, and to get the apology from the president. Uh, but to get waved off while everyone, everyone who, who is listening, who hasn't graduated yet, you know, there's always a ceremony. And the last thing you ever do when you stick your hand out to get your diploma is to be told, get off the stage audibly. And so I got off the stage and I was dazed and I went to my parents and my mom and dad were crying first ever to graduate from Harvard, but no diploma. So it was a suboptimal situation. Yeah. So, so you graduate, you, you've just done like this kind of breaking news on campus and taking a risk and you know, it, 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 it's pretty shocking what the response is. So you graduate, like tell me about what you were thinking about when you wanted to start likely a journalism career from a standpoint of the risks, rewards, and how you even went about starting well, that. I was very unsophisticated. Um, I had a big Afro. I had one jacket, a corduroy jacket that I got at Marshalls. And uh, I had no context. I had always been a rebel. I had worked hard to piss everybody off. Uh, always wanted to do it myself, my way. Like I was like Sinatra or something. And so I wrote, I just figured, you know what you do? You write really good letters and you include clips and you tell people you'll go see them. And I sent it to 53 uh, newspapers and I was rejected from all of them. And I have all of the rejections. And one by one, as those newspapers fold, I cheer because I hated them. It was, uh, they were so callous. I mean, the Dallas Bureau of the Wall Street Journal flew me down. And within a few minutes, they said, you're not right for us. And I remember saying, well, could you at least like, you know, maybe like make a decision and like send me a letter. And he said, no, no, you're not right for us. Uh, I got a rejection from the New York Times. I think I didn't even apply and I got the rejection. It was so bad. So the whole time, I'm living at home. Fabulous girlfriend. Okay, keep that off. We still on? Yeah, we're still on. Okay, I got some big W on. I would, I'd rather, oh, there you are. So um, <laughs> I graduate and I, I, of course, don't have the diploma. That's a negative. Uh, and after I send the letters out, June, you know, June, July, August. In August, my mom says, enough. And I said, well, I just got rejected everywhere. I mean, I have no place to go. She goes, no. Well, you're not living here. I don't think you're approaching this seriously enough. Uh, you wow. gotta get, you have to pay rent. I said, but mom, I don't have any money. Uh, you know, I'd gotten a scholarship at Harvard, and still so I have any money. And she goes, well, I don't care. So I called my aunt in Washington, D.C., Aunt Nathalie, 
and uh, she was in her 70s, her kids have grown up. She lived on Jennifer in Washington. And I said, Aunt Natalie, can I move in with you? And she goes, why? And I said, because my mom's kicking me out of the house. She won't let me stay here. I mean, and Aunt Natalie was fabulous. She said, come on, you live on the third floor. And then I applied and I got a job at the uh, at Congressional Quarterly. But it wasn't a, a great job because when I got there, um, the guy said, listen, you're gonna be our key operator. I said, oh my God, this is fantastic. We're at our college, I'm the key operator. This is like, I can't believe it. And he said, you know, and you'll just be on call, it'll be fantastic. Well, it turns out key operator was the orange light that goes off on the Xerox machine. It says call key operator when it's broken. Okay. So I got some lessons on how to fix the Xerox machine. And that's what I did. Uh, and you know, that again was a suboptimal job, but I was never discouraged because I was bat, I was um, bat guano crazy. I love though that you didn't have an ego about it. You got your foot in the door and, and clearly that worked out. No, I had, I was also unstoppable. I mean, I was, I was unstoppable. I was going to get what I wanted. And what I ended up doing is that when I got the congressional quarterly job, a lot of the rejection letters turned into letters from people. And this is important for everybody who's watching. When they said they kept it in their file, that was considered to be a rejection. Do you know, it wasn't. I got a lot of calls from companies that had rejected me. So what I did after every rejection, as much as I despised them, I sent them nice letters saying, thank you very much for considering me. Uh, I hope that when you say you, uh, you keep me on file, that you understand I am definitely interested and I'm not deterred. I'll tell you a story about Goldman wow. Sachs later if you want to hear that one when I got that job. But the great thing was I got a, I got a call from um, Mike Pride, the Tallahassee Democrat, and that's where I got my big break. And I left my aunt and athlete, my late aunt and athlete, who was so sensational and moved to Tallahassee, where I was, I made, I was making a cool $18,000 a year. Uh, and I thought that was a lot. And I remember telling my grandfather who lived in Florida that I was making 18,000. And, and he said, he said, when I think about that, he said, I hope that's not a year. Meaning he was hoping it was like a month, but that's what I was making. Wow. I stole my first pay um, stuff. I kept my first pay stuff. And they took a lot after awesome. United Way. There was very little left. Yeah, um, still to this day, lots of taxes. Um, before we move into, I, I know I'm, to everyone watching, we'll switch over to the audience Q&A in five or 10 minutes, but before we move into kind of the finance side of your career and how that all got started, I, I know a lot of people want to hear about advice you have for those students watching who are paying their way through school by trading stocks at night. I just want to, I, I love Why are they the trading story. At night? I traded stocks right from class. I just, <laughs> I had, um, there was a great merger that was uh, so, Southern California, uh, SoCal, which was then, and now Chevron, was buying Gulf Oil. And everyone thought that there was no way that the antitrust department, the Justice Department would approve it. I was a wayward student at law school, but I did take antitrust. And the one thing I got out of it was I went to Phil Rita, who was the dean of antitrust. And I said, Just, Mr. Rita, is that deal going to get, pa get passed? And he goes, who are you? I said, I'm Jim Cramer. And he says, have you ever been in this class? I said, I'm in the back row every day. He says, are you the guy reading the Wall Street Journal every day and, dis and disturbing the whole class? I said, absolutely, that's me. He said, I don't know why I'm going to do this, but I know that that deal is going to be approved. So I, I took every penny I had and I made $25,000 and I paid for law school. Wow. So don't okay, trade wait, so at night, let's trade a day. Trade during so, I so borrowed everything. We... It was all my student loan money and I put it all I put it all on Chevron. Well, so here's the question. Would you give, for those watching who want to trade and maybe are, are not professional traders, but want to make some money, especially because, you know, unemployment's high, it's hard to make money right now, especially for someone right out of college. What, what advice do you give to them? Okay, first, as much as I love my friend Dave Portnoy, um, don't necessarily follow Dave. I, I love Dave and he is a buddy of mine, but Dave does a lot of high risk strategies and sometimes he picks the names out of a hat, but he's got people excited about stocks. And I have waited all my life for someone else to do that besides me. And I love him for that. What I would do is I would pick, because these people are younger, go spec. Okay. I don't want anything that is other than speculative. If you want to do hydrogen fuel cells, that's fine. If you want to do a race to the moon, that's fine. But also have some of the traditional software as a service specs, the high growth companies, 
uh, have a drug company or two uh, that's involved with the pandemic, uh, um, own Advanced Micro, own a couple companies with some really great CEOs that I talk about all the time that are in my charitable trust. Uh, but you, you got to have four or five stocks. And two of them, are, two of them could be trading stocks that you could trade, you know, trade because you see something's going to happen. And the rest you have to own. Uh, but make it so that they're growth. If I see someone buying an oil stock, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna get to you, and I'm gonna find you, and I'm gonna wring your neck. You have to buy growth because you're younger, and if it doesn't work, you got your whole life to make it up again. Me, I gotta go with right. like stupid stuff, you know, like Verizon. I'm not allowed to own stocks. I'm only allowed to own mutual funds, which is really a shame because they're no good. Wow. So, so okay. And what about those who are watching who don't have money, right? Like the average. Oh, everybody has money. Graduating I was. I lived in my car. Listen to me. There isn't anyone in this who's watching. Any of the people who I hope I have more than Ben Adore is watching, uh, who are poorer than I am. I was broken into. I had everything stolen when I was covering a sniper down in uh, San Diego. Uh, Brenda Spencer. She unfortunately killed five kids. A principal. When I came back from San Diego. It was like I was broom clean. There was nothing left. The guy took my checking account. I had no place to go. So I lived in my car. So I do not want to hear it because I still put $10 a week away in a mutual fund. And that $10 a week, I am proud to say, is now equal to $880,000. Wow. That's incredible. So if someone even performed half as well, that's a lot of so, money. I mean, like to, people say, oh, I only have $10. I mean, you know, you go into the movie. Hey, you can't go to the movies. Take that money. The money that you use when you go and, and, and you, you, you buy um, Hanover pretzels. I don't know. You, you, you buy um, Campbell's chicken noodle. You put $10 a week away. You have it. I had it. And it wasn't just because I didn't have homeowners insurance. I had it and I put it away. And I have told, I've revealed for the first time how much by doing it, I ended up making. I typically don't want to do it, but I want to encourage people to save. Uh, I put it in the Fidelity Magellan Fund. So anyone who says they don't have money, those people are wrong. If I had money living in my car with, by the way, underwear to the left, okay, uh, pants to the right, a shirt, and I had the same pants, the same shirt every day, and that same beat up uh, uh, corduroy jacket. Um, and the only thing that is good about it is that when you're at a bar and, some, and you say your place or mine, in the end, it has to be the other person's place. Yeah, clearly. Other, well, maybe some people are open to a car. You never know. I mean, you were. So Fort Fairmont, 1970, okay. 1979. Um, uh, so, job. so before we go to the audience questions, I really want to hear more about this mask initiative you've started, especially because people watching, I'm about to give you a chance to get a million dollars. So, okay. Jim, tell, tell so, everyone about this. My buddy, Mark Benioff, who runs, I know it's not about friends. It's not about money. It's, it's about money. It's not about friends. That's what I always say. But sometimes it's about friends and money. My friend, Mark Benioff, who's the CEO of Salesforce, uh, he and I, one night he called me from Hawaii. He was really down. And he said, we, if we all wore masks for, four, for three or four weeks in this country, we could wipe this thing out. And he said, you just come back from the East Asia where Taiwan had wiped it out, South Korea wiped it out, you know, China wiped it out. Sure, they still have flares, but we have flares for measles because of the anti-vaxxers. Um, those countries wiped it out because they had masks. And he said, how do we get everyone to wear masks? And I, and I, I said, give me an hour. So I called back an hour later. I said, we do a contest. We give a million dollars away. And anybody between the ages of 15 to 24 who designs a community mask, not trying to top the N95, which is the Honeywell mask, but a community, and it's, it feels horrible, and it's hot, and messes you, gives you a huge ring of pimples. It's like, I always call it the ring of fire, it's Johnny Cash. Uh, but you can do this, you, so if you can develop one that's comfortable, stylish, we have all these influencers, TikTok influencers on the panel, we have the Harvard people on the panel, and we're gonna get it made, we believe we can get it made by Honeywell. Uh, because they were they introduced it with us so it would become it's an open source product as we call it 15 to 24 1 million dollars if you win people are doing it in teams we already have uh 450 teams from 30 37 countries but you know how about winning a million bucks with a mask that is comfortable that protects you and protects me and is stylish and then i said go and so we have million dollars and boom we want to give it away there's, all so you have to do is 15, you have to go X prize, years X, old? Go X P R I Z E. I know it's tickle. Tick, tick, it's tick, it's 
difficult, X-P-R-I-Z-E dot org, org slash mask, X-Prize dot org dot slash mask. And you can enter the next gen mask challenge, start a team, and I want to give you a million bucks. I mean, right now. I mean, like, I want you to have a million bucks, and all you got to do is design a mask that's better than what we have. I love it. And then they really have no excuse not to be investing, given that they'll have a million bucks there to you invest. Go. I want to give you a million dollars. You don't like your mask. I, you know, look, my mask is made by Honeywell. It's the sport model. It's a pretty good mask. Honeywell guys, you know, they gave it to me, and it's got a filter inside. It's very good, but it, you know, makes me look like Spider Man, and that's also cool. But this, this, but the taxi cab yours thing, total loser. Okay, and it's too hot. So get in there and design a better mask. And what I was trying to do is get the people from say RISD to work with Brown. Get the Brown scientists, get the RISD designers, Parsons. You know, my, my daughter went to Parsons. They should be doing it with another, with Cooper Union. Uh, at, at Claremont College, they should do the Harvey Mudd, you know, that kind of Pomona. I, you need to have both science and artistry. And you can win a million bucks of my money and Benny House money. More is the money. Amazing. Amazing. All and right. Well, now exciting. that someone People on really this call. Up a lot, but I need someone from this to win my money. Yeah, that would be amazing. What an ROI for anyone watching. Um, okay, I want to switch to the audience questions because they're awesome. Um, to start, so let's start with James. He's a student at Millsaps College, and he wants to get into journalism after graduation. And so Why? wants to know just what advice you have for undergrads who are interested in the industry. Don't. And then someone else Don't. asked. You'll never make any money. You'll never be able to have a, afford a family. It's going away. No. No, don't be silly. No. Do you really feel that way? Yes. Here's what you do. All right, this is really important. Go make a lot of money and then be a journalist. I gave a, class, I gave a talk to some Yale kids, a big Yale gathering, and they, they were all journalism. And I said, okay, listen, here's the deal. Not one of you I want to be journalist. Every one of you I want to go make millions of dollars because then you can tell the truth because then you won't be playing for dinner. It's the play for dinner concept. You can't tell the truth if you have no money. Why? Because there are very powerful people who can put pressure on your institution. Now, I'm in an institution where you can't pressure. CNBC cannot be pressured because it's too big. Um, but it's going to take you forever to move up to that. But if you go make a lot of money and do some journalism on the side, like I did when I was at Goldman Sachs, bingo. So my advice to this gentleman is to go make a lot of money and then be a journalist. Don't reverse it because it, it doesn't, it's not lucrative is the way I would do it. It's one of the least lucrative professions on earth. Wow. Okay. Well, there you have it from one of the, the people who've made it to pretty much the top of the ladder, the top of the top of the ladder. So, uh, Definitely helpful. Um, what about uh, on the finance side of your career? Um, Josh, who is a student at Wabash College, wants to know what advice you have for kids. He calls himself a kid, I would argue, uh, you know, a young adult who uh, doesn't go to a Target or kind of top 10 school and wants to get into Wall Street. Go back to graduate school. Don't come here. What kind of grad school? MBA? Uh, accounting is, is very much a need. I would say that's the number one profession that's in need is accounting. The second would be computer science. And the third would be MBA. Awesome. Those are the degrees. And then, uh, you know, and if you get a computer science degree from a major state university, or if you get an accounting degree from a major state university where you may be able to, like my daughter went to Oregon, you know, you know it was, it was uh, $3,000 a semester. This is just graduate. Um, to, from Southern Oregon University, and she, she was te a teacher. Uh, and you can go to a good school uh, where you get this graduate degree, and then you come to New York, and everyone wants a count. Everybody wants a guy with a count. Everyone wants a guy with a computer science. Uh, and then only then would you go for MBA. Awesome. Okay. And um I, I guess, so for those who are starting in Wall Street or are starting in journalism, I'm getting a lot of questions from people who are in internships or uh, a few from who are actually full-time just started in their careers. And they wanna know, what can people do to stand out? So if someone is working for you as an intern or entry level, how do they cast your eye? Like, what do they oh, have to okay, do to so make you even thing. notice them? Here's the first thing. Don't ever say, uh. Second, don't ever say like. Third. 
don't ever say, you know. So when I hear any of those, they're done. You're just done. I'm not even paying attention to you. I'm like, I'm doing something. I'm like, I'm on my phone immediately. I'm like texting my daughter, you do this stuff. Next, look me in the eye. If you look down, I just babble on. I'll talk about the Phillies, the Eagles. I, nothing substantive because I got to get you off my calendar. And I just say, I mean, I look at this guy and I'm like thinking, or this guy. Oh, so, you know, I was like, okay, all right. Sometimes I do this. You know, I'll go like this if you do that stuff. I'll like, you know, like make clocks, you know, 12, 1, 2, because I have to pass the time. I'll listen to this at 5, 6, and then I'll like, like, okay, that's great. Or I'll text, please interrupt me, you know, to my assistant, because there's, you know, oh those are God. people who don't look me in the eye are, are absolutely absurd. Dress well. Take whatever you have and buy nice clothes. And don't be casual. Presume that the person might be well dressed. Don't come in. There's a guy who came into me. He's wearing corduroys and jeans. Uh, he was pretty smart. I passed him off to the editor in chief. This is at the street, and he wouldn't see him. I said, Brian, I want you to take a look at this. No, I said, No, I, I think he's a smart guy. I said, no, it was in front of him. I, I, I said, What do you mean? What do you? He goes, well, Look how he's dressed. I said, but, I mean, He's right here. Could you like at least take me aside and say, Hey, look how he's dressed? And then he left. Okay, so that was an unsuccessful interview. Uh, I would, when I do the interview, when I, when someone is interview is here to be interviewed by me, I, oh, let's say it's stocks. I they want to know, they want to write business about stocks. I need five stocks and I need you to tell me about them and why I should buy them. No one's been able to do that other than Matt Jacobs, who became my research director of my hedge fund. One guy, one guy. Come early. I used to tell people, I want you at 4 a.m. And I want, you, I want you to bring Krispy Kremes. That was when I weighed 220. I now weigh 175. Um, and it, it, there only one guy who did it. Again, it was Matt Jacobs. You have to deliver. Matt's now a tremendous, wealthy portfolio manager. So you got to come on time, which means come really early. You got to dress really well. You can't use the, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, look me in the eye. Call me Mr. Kramer and call the person Ms. Kramer until uh, corrected otherwise. And, and this is the most important thing, know everything about that person. Google him. Everything's, everything's good. You, you Google, I, I have an interview tonight with a guy from B&G Foods. And I Google it. I say, oh, he lives in Persephone. Okay, well, my daughter played Persephone in field hockey. I wonder whether his kids, how old are his kids? Maybe one of his kids played against one of my kids. I have kids who played sports. Uh, oh, Persephone, I know that uh, there's Route 10. That means there's a place called Chevy's. I happen to love to eat there. Maybe he's been there before. Has he been to, uh, uh, to the Road Tavern, which is owned by my buddy? Maybe he's been there, right? Have commonality. Find commonality, commonality with their kids, commonality with their spouse. If there's no commonality with him or, or with her, where do they go to the beach in the summer? We well, you know, have a sense of that. Know, where, know about them. Everything that you can Google, you Google. Know where their husbands or wives went to school besides where they did. Find out if there's any commonality of school and class. All these have to be done so when you come in, you're more confident, look the person in the eye, and when the, when the person says, why, why are you even here? You know, and this just, the person just shows little respect. You say, you know why I'm here? Because my mother actually was great friends with your mother in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Germantown, PA. Then suddenly it's like, really, tell me, what was my mom like? Oh, well, my mom has this thing. She tells a story about your mom. You're going to get that job. You will get that job. Uh, awesome. awesome. That's what happens. You get the job. Okay. And you get it because of the homework and it shows. And otherwise, all we're trying to do is get you off our calendar. Um, okay. I have a whole different track now. Um, Tate, who's a student, actually a triple major at Drake University, econ, finance, and theater, wants triple. to know what advice do you have for someone trying to get the producer track? Trying to get the producer track? Yeah, who wants to go in their like career TV? into being a producer. Yeah. Okay, you gotta, you gotta be willing to work for nothing for your first four years. Uh, a producer job, unfortunately, is another job where, uh, and I am candid with this group, you gotta have a lot of money. Your family's gotta be rich. Now see, this is unfortunate. No one ever tells you this stuff, so I'm telling it. Uh, some of these jobs are, they pay you very little because a lot of the rich people would pay to have the job. That's always been my definition. And that comes from the fact that I was at the LA Herald Examiner 
there was a guy next to me who always put his paycheck in the drawer. He had a big stack of his paychecks. He never cashed them. And I said, why? And he said, because it's a nuisance to go to the bank. And I understood. I went to his house and he was really rich. And I never forgot that there are people who don't want to cash their paycheck because it's a nuisance. And that's who you're up against when you try to get a producer job. Obviously, you want an internship. Uh, obviously, you want to send a million letters. Uh, obviously, you have to be willing to work in Anniston, Alabama, or you have to be willing to work in um, uh, um, a suburb of Milwaukee, not even Milwaukee. Uh, and so you have to cast a wide net. Uh, PBS, you really work for nothing. But your main thing is you're going to have to go to what, what my mom always called the provinces or the hinterlands to get started. Uh, and then you work your way up three, four years later to uh, Des Moines. And then you, you get there for the election, you know, for the primaries. And then next thing you know, you're going to find yourself in uh, Detroit. And remember, these places all have TV stations, but that's what you're up against. And to get to CNBC, obviously, you have to go through the page program internship. Very, very hard. And uh, you, need, you need a friend uh, on the, uh, who's a professor who has kids who work at CNBC. And that can, you can have that. But remember, I, I really, I'm not encouraging about the profession because it's under assault by Google and by Facebook, uh, by Apple, by Amazon. Uh, it's under assault by Pinterest and by Twitter and, and, and by, as, as my friend Strauss Zelnick would say, the clock in your head. There's only so much time. Reed Hastings would say the same thing from, from Netflix. You only have, it, it, there's many things that you want to do of, of which reading or watching TV is no longer uh, in the top 10. Uh, I just did a TikTok for the Next Gen Mask Challenge, and it was a lot of fun, but I wouldn't exactly call it uh, Shakespearean. Okay, fair. Um, so, so I know that you obviously talked a lot about... Uh-oh, you're that. breaking up here. Oh, so sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so my next question, Matthew from John Hopkins, who's an intern at Guggenheim Partners, wants to know how you transitioned then from media into actually starting your own TV show, like how you did it, you know, what inspired you to do okay. it? Okay, okay. Um, the defensive coordinator of uh, the Philadelphia Eagles went to John Hopkins. Completely irrelevant, but I care. The, okay, so the way that I transitioned was through radio. Uh, Radio needs people, uh, develop personalities. Uh, you can, the guy who runs uh, talk on Sirius XM, Dave Gorab was my first producer. Dave's fabulous. If you have something to say, Dave will listen. You can look him up. He's the leader of that group. And where'd you go? Oh, you uh, and, and I think that that's how you start. That's how I started. I did a radio show for four years called Real Money. And uh, Jeff Zucker, who at that point was running NBC, watched it made. And I said, listen, I want to do this on TV. And he said, that's great. When can you start? And I started a month later. So it was my transition was from that show I do now was from the radio show. Uh, the show I did with my friend Larry Kudlow, who's the chief economic advisor, was more, that was post-mortem of 9-11. Of so that's not going to, hopefully not going to happen again. But, uh, but Mad Money was, uh, was a radio show that I did that was a very popular radio show around the country uh, that uh, you have to, when you're in radio, you have to be careful because you have to accept the challenge that if you have a lot of cats like I did, that Purina a cat shell maybe wants you to be the spokesperson. So you have to be willing to do that. And you have to be commercial, so to speak. And I always... I never did a commercial for something that I didn't use. So I never endorsed something that I, I, that I didn't find I liked. So when I was doing some body scan thing for Princeton, Princeton body scan, I went and have one done. You know, I, I don't like to endorse things that I don't use. But yeah, the way you, radio is the, is the best way. Where you go to Portnoy way. My friend Dave Portnoy, you know, he just kind of started it up in his basement. And now it took him 20 years. People don't realize that. It was not an overnight success. 
and I get a kick out of him because uh, he is bringing new people into the stock market by the droves. Uh, he's also incredibly funny, uh, irreverent. There are people uh, my age who think that he is bringing a disrepute to the business and they ought to just go to get over themselves. So you can do it, you can do it your own and hope it catches on, but that's not easy. But it's certainly the way, another way to go. Awesome. So speaking of alternative ways, a few people are asking about whether you think in this new world where a lot of people are not going to be even on campus this fall, do you think that degrees are worth it? Do you think that there are some professions in finance or I'm sorry, you're breaking up again. We got to fix that. Do you uh, think I'm, that I'm sorry. So uh, people are asking whether you think degrees are always worth it. Do you think that there's a world where someone can be successful in finance without going to college? No. Uh, they're, they're few and far between. Now, look, you could say, well, Mark Zuckerberg didn't finish, and uh, Gates, who was in my class at Harvard, didn't finish, and that's fine. Uh, and maybe that's you. Maybe you're Leonardo da Vinci. I don't know. Uh, but you want to do what's easier. All right? One of the things, you, you don't want the hard path. You want the easier path. And people recruit people from these schools because they need bodies. And you want to be one of the people who's recruited. Uh, it's terrible not have any money to get a job so, and to try to get a job. So you still go into college for two things. You go to college to get a job and you go to college for contacts. And um, the other part, the education is uh, way overrated. Now, my wife is on the board of Bucknell. We spent a lot of time there, and it's an amazing school. And John Brobman's the president. And I think they're all working to try to figure out the best way to deal with the pandemic. And I like, I like the education, but I just think there's a lot of people who think, that, you know, that I'm saying, listen, you really do go there for a job and for, and for your contacts and for your friends. Uh, and I said that in my speech at Bucknell, but I, I was being somewhat facetious. The degree that they have there on uh, English and business man and management is fantastic because I find too many people, and this is really important for people who are watching, listen to this. There are too many people who know how to write but don't know anything about business. And there's too many people who uh, know about business but don't know how to write. And they also don't know how to communicate. So there, there are people who know business but they can't get the job because they can't communicate. They don't know how to write well. And you have to have both skills. So uh, college is very meaningful for getting a job. It's very meaningful for the contacts. But the main thing that I would understand, people should understand, is you need to be able to write and you need to be able to read. And if you're going into business, you need to have some facility with numbers. Not a lot. I mean, arithmetic, not mathematics. Awesome. And hopefully, sorry about that. I think the hurricane had messed up my uh, yeah, audio. Yeah, hurricane. Damn. <laughs> Um, that's great. Uh, so, so staying on this topic of finance, Connor from JP Morgan, I think he's an intern there. Wants Connor, to know, <laughs> did what, I hire you once? What area of finance do you think is the most threatened as we move into the next decade? Most for, threatened? Yeah, for the profession. Um, what's a good question from Connor from JP Morgan? Uh, I would say derivatives. Uh, because I think we're going to discover in this next generation that all they are is jamming people. They're just jamming people, meaning you're ripping people off. And we all know you are because I've been in the business. Uh, we want total transparency. And just like well, the reason why we have uh, no commissions on stocks, we're sick of the jamming. You create a product, therefore you can name the price. What do you think you are, like Brioni suits or something? You know, go in the suit business for heaven's sake. Get your ass to Milan. I really don't like the, uh, the jamming. Um, and we all know it. That, you know, I, that's what they called it when I was at Goldman. Um, you know, maybe it's uh, the VIG, the whamma jamma. But uh, I know what you're doing. And, and don't think that anybody, that, that, you're the only, that you think that uh, I'm the only one who knows. We all know that that's how you get that big price tag. Because they, people can't see, there's no transparency. And you're putting a couple, you're taking out a couple of points. And that's going to end. That game is going to end. I mean, I wish I could say it was going to be the fast trading. It's going to end, but the, the, there's always people stupid enough to give money to these fast traders, um, and they got unlimited. Amount, the stupid people have an unlimited amount of money, uh, which is incredible. It's almost like a birthright thing. But I, I do believe that, yeah, the idea that you can just create a lot of product that uh, snows people, 
It's tiresome. Get out of it. Awesome. Good for him, though, JP Morgan. I got a lot of buzz there. Awesome. Um, Akila, who's an intern at Syracuse. Actually, I have to say, a lot of people are writing and saying that they, you're their role model. They want to follow your career path. They want to be you. So, Akila. Are they kidding? <laughs> Akila. What do they want? Like, you know what? Yeah, look at this. I have a migraine problem. I got to do this every couple of years. We'll set it up. You know, I'm the American Migraine Foundation spokesperson. Um, no, they want to be me. Holy cow, you're out of your mind. I mean, the last thing you want to do is be me. I mean, do you never want to sleep? Do you want to be the, the, the target of massive ridicule on Twitter at Jim Cramer? Uh, I don't know. But if they want to, you know, God love them. Right? God love them. All right, so for one of them, Akila, a student at Syracuse, she wants to know. Uh, oh, just a second. All right. <laughs> My migraines and the weather's kicking in. She wants to know um, what, but she, she really wants to follow your career path and wants to know what books that have been most helpful for you in business as you. Okay, there's actually only one. You don't have to worry. Uh, all you gotta do is read um, One Up on Wall Street, and, and that's by Peter Lynch. Uh, my editor, Bob Bender, was his editor, uh, and it's fabulous. And then you can go read, if you want to really read about some incredibly crazy, wacko guy, you can read Confessions of a Street Addict by me. Uh, but definitely go uh, one up on Wall Street. Don't do Graham and Dodd. It's like so hard. I mean, it's like, oh, please uh, be very aware of, of, of what's around you. If you're going to be in, uh, in, in the stock business, that's what matters, eyes and ears. Uh, curiosity. But, uh, but one up on Wall Street will do everything you need. That will make you into someone that people say you can't be because we have all these clowns. Oh, excuse me, I'm Jimmy Chill. We have all these ill-advised people who say that you, there's a thing called single stock risk. And that means you, you got to be careful. You can't, own, you, gotta, you can't own Apple or Facebook or Amazon or Alphabet or Netflix. The stocks that I recommended that are up like gazillion, you got to be in the S&P. You know, those are people who want your fees. They want your fees. That's their job. And again, I see through them. This is okay. It's okay. They're not charlatans. They're map box. Awesome. Often confused. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to take a, a break on career questions for a few minutes because we've got a lot of investment questions people want to know about. So, okay. Um, Oliver, a Baruch college student getting a finance degree. I hired from Baruch in the old days. Great accounting. And my uh, chief uh, uh, forensic accountant that I work with, Matt Horwey. I went to Baruch and finished at the top of his class. Awesome. So Oliver wants to know, since you mentioned m and do you think Microsoft will get TikTok? Uh, yes. And I think they will um, because they've got the money and they're not under federal scrutiny. Um, I wish Verizon would, if Verizon had uh, creativity. It takes creativity because you have to recognize that TikTok is not necessarily what you see it now. TikTok can be something in the future that uh, gravitates, that's a platform that you get the 15 to 24, like my mass competition. Uh, actually, it's more 15 to 18, but that's okay. You see, when, when, this is what people have to understand. When you're that age, you're trying to figure out whether you're going to use Colgate or Crest. You're trying to figure out whether you're going to be someone who stays at home and cooks or goes out. Uh, you're going to be uh, tied. Are you going to be oxidal? Whatever. Uh, all those things come into play. Lysol versus Clorox. And so everybody wants you, all the advertisers want you, and you've got to be willing to, um, you, 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 if you're going to buy TikTok, you have to understand that it isn't what it is now. It's what it can be. And you could integrate uh, a lot of different personalities in there. When people make content, like I just did from a mass competition, I make content. I love any business where I send you content and uh, I pay for it. Well, that's a great business. Think about that. Hey, how much did it cost to do TikTok today? Nothing. You see people send stuff. Well, how much did you pay them? Nothing. They send stuff. That's a business you want to be in. And Microsoft needs, uh, it needs social. That's the one pillar that it doesn't have. And because they grilled, you know, some clown said that Apple wants to buy them. Well, I mean, the whole point of what of my interview with Apple last week was that Tim Cook said, we don't do that. Uh, that's why we're not in trouble with antitrust. Facebook obviously couldn't. Uh, uh, Amazon couldn't. Uh, Disney's got uh, a balance sheet that's too weak. Uh, Verizon could do it. They own uh, they own Yahoo, and they own um, America Online AOL, and they would and the president would love them. The president wouldn't ask for any fee. Uh, right now, he's asking for key money. Whatever. 
heck that is. Key money to me was like the 50 cents my mom left so I could go get some Del Monte food cocktail. Uh, but I feel very strongly that this was, if I were running Verizon, this would be a no-brainer. I just raised the money tonight, uh, probably for 2% 2 money, and, uh, and buy TikTok. But, you know, I'm not running Verizon, but, oh, my God, I wish I were. I really do. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, they've definitely done interesting things with their investments and acquisitions, that's for sure. Um, okay, so um, a student named Brendan wants to know what- Where's Brendan from? He didn't share, so I don't oh, know. Oh, Brendan, will you like, cut it out, man? <laughs> but Brendan wants to know what industry you believe is going to explode within- Oh, Binghamton, from Binghamton. There you go, and they got a great math department. He's at Binghamton School. I'd hire anyone from math in that school. Right. So what industry do you believe is going to explode within the next five to 10 years if some of these students are thinking about which industry they want to be in based on career growth and trajectory? Well, look, first of all, I don't really care. Just get in computer science. Because then whatever industry does explode, you will know it, all right? Um, I would tell you that I, my first would be video games. I think video games are replacing television. I think that they are something that people can play this, the uh, PC, not on this. This is my super brain charger. Uh, but that, that's what you, you, you that, that's going to be the area that's going to explode. Because when you see the Grand Theft Auto is the number one entertainment property, not movie, number one entertainment property of all time, what that says is, wow, um, I want to be in that business. Same with uh, NBA 2K. And one of the reasons you want to do it is because NVIDIA, which is one of the greatest companies on earth, has a chip that makes it so that it really, you can't tell the difference between you and a replica of you. And that's why I think that business is going to be absolutely fantastic. That's crazy. Um, okay, uh, back to kind of career growth. So Bonnie, a student at BU, wants to know who are your mentors and how did you get them? Okay, my daughter went to BU among uh, several schools. Uh, and. Uh, Liked it okay, because she didn't like that urban environment. She lived on Com Ave. Uh, my mentors were Don Forst, passed away, unfortunately, who uh, was my editor at the LA Herald Examiner. One day I came in and I said, look, I want to do this article. I think it's really great. It exposes this guy that he goes, and I said, so what, is you, what are you about? He didn't know me. And I said, I'm about telling the truth. And he said, Jim, I never forgot this. The truth can only be found in novels. He said, well, no, I, newspaper goes, no, you'll never be able to tell the truth. Only in novels. Then he gave me a group of novels. They're really amazing. So I really like that. Bill Groover, um, the, uh, the person in charge of hiring at Goldman Sachs, who uh, told me I had no chance many times, rejected me many times. I took them all as maybes. Then had me come down. Uh, at nine o'clock, stay in a room where he said somebody would come by. I stayed there. There were no PCs back then. Stayed there, stayed there, stayed there. I came out, you know, at, at one o'clock and said, hey, look, uh, maybe it's just some deal. He goes, listen, we're going to get you. We're going to get you. Just stay there. Just stay. We're going to get you. It's been a very busy morning. And then I emerged in the room at five o'clock and there's nobody there. It was a learning lesson. That was, and I love this guy. Can you believe it? I love this guy. Uh, so he's been an inspiration. It was really interesting. You know, it, it, so I, when, when it happened, after it happened, I wrote and I said, you know, I had an incredible time waiting in the closet for an interview. Uh, and, and you know what? I can tell I'm getting closer and closer to getting this Goldman job. I can feel it. That's how close. I know it's coming. He said, and he wrote back. He said, I can't take it anymore. Come down. So I came down and he goes, I just, I've never seen anybody like you. You have been told no so many times. I left you in a closet all day and you're back. So here's what I have to say to you. You're hired. And I was so excited. I ran into the coat closet and I took a partner's coat by mistake. Uh, this coat looked like mine. I realized when I got to the airport, holy cow, it was his coat. So I ran back very quickly. And just when I put it there, he was coming out. I said, oh, here's your coat. He says, who are you? I said, I'm Jim Kramer. And we ended up doing some business. So, um, yeah, that was a great mentor. Um, let's see, mentors, other mentors, yeah, other like mentors. Her parents, uh, her got a new my sister at law school, she told me that don't, you didn't have to do a thing after the first year. And she was right. 
and it turned out to be just this social life explosion, really unbelievable. So that was you know, very good. Um, and I don't know, I, I maybe it. Awesome. Um, it definitely sounds like you're very, you have perseverance to an extreme. Which oh no, I'm, you're not gonna stop me. I'm gonna go through the brick wall. Uh, I give a speech to the, not this year because of the stupid COVID, give a speech to the Eagles about that. It's called, I gave it, it's called TNP. I take no prisoners. Love I was it. not going to say no to that. You know, that Goldman job was going to be mine. I got so many rejection letters from Goldman and I would come, I would write them back. I said, listen, this is a very interesting point of view. I can see you're incredibly interested in me. And then he would send me letters. Says, that is not the intent of the letter. And I said, well, then I guess I'm confusing the intent of the letter because to me, what you're saying is maybe. And that's why he left me in the closet all day because he figured maybe I would stop bothering him. But I didn't mind. That was clearly a maybe. So clearly you're very motivated. And so Ben from Davidson College wants to know today, what, mo what is your main motivation and what wakes you up every day? All right. Uh, first of all, I want to be better than everybody else because that's ridiculous, but true. But what motivates me is to try to get people to know about the market and to know about stocks. And I'm undeterred by those who say, listen, you can only be in index funds. I'm fine with index funds. They're fine. But I want, to, I want to get people excited and interested in being intelligent about companies so that they can make their portfolio big, bigger like mine did. And so that they can uh, be as turned on as I am, or at least somewhat, to the greatness of American companies. And uh, international companies, but not, not so much American companies. And learn how CEOs work and learn how companies work and develop your own portfolio uh, with my help from Mad Money or the morning show is much more about interpreting news. But I, I want to be the great color man for business. Just like when I covered sports and was a sports writer at college, the color man is the guy who's, who's, who had been on the field and is now in the booth. That's me. And I want to have everybody understand how it works so they can make the most informed decisions. And that's really what I'm doing. Um, awesome. Uh, so, so actually we're going to talk about your law school because I have a question about it and we haven't really talked too much about it. Um, so Alice, who's a law school student, I don't know where, just wants to know why, you know, like, how did you think about your law career or, and, and did you think about becoming a trial lawyer? They just want to Okay. Well, I wrote to, um, when I was my first year at law school, uh, I wrote to a bunch of firms and I got hired by Fried Frank, nice firm. Um, there used to be a guy who would bring mail around all day. And one day he said to me, listen, I, I, there's something I got to tell you. I said, what? He goes, when you're falling asleep, don't fall asleep on the buttons on your sleeve because it always leaves a button mark in your head and you always have that imprint of the button. And I said, how do you know I'm asleep? He goes, well, how else would you get the imprint of the button? He said, maybe you sleep like this. So, I mean, uh-oh, wow. Hey, the lights are out. Can you still see me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can see you and we can hear you perfectly. How exciting is this? Is this real life? Okay, so um, I realized that perhaps it wasn't for me uh, because that very nice gentleman who brought the mail by every day was correct that the button, I was sleeping on my sleeve and the fact is, is that I was lucky that it didn't go permit. It was that poor. So the next year I decided I'm going to be a prosecutor. That's why I originally wanted to go to school. And so I send uh, a Giuliani a letter. He was running the Southern District. Outright rejected. I mean, like, not even like, you know, it was like, please don't bother us ever again. I did not take that as a maybe. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go over to the business school. I take some classes, look at that, audit some stuff and go into the uh, library and learn about companies. So I learned a lot about companies and I saw that there was a, a, a flyer which just says, come to uh, the, uh, it was the Ritz Carlton, uh, there's a cocktail party for Goldman Sachs. So I said, oh good, I always wanted to get corporate finance and maybe make a lot of money, but do m and So I got there, I came and, um, and there was a guy there who said, uh, so uh, what do you want to do? Why do you want to be in sales and trading? And you have to think on your feet. I said, well, I've always been a great salesperson. 
I mean, I can sell anything. I can sell snow, uh, iced Eskimos. I mean, I didn't know I was going to do with sales. I mean, I thought it was corporate finance. So, well, that's great. Okay, well, um, if you were a stock, what would you be? No, this is a different time. I said, well, I'd be Exxon. I'd be the biggest with the best balance sheet and a great dividend. And he said, what's the second highest mountain on earth? I say, K2. He goes, okay, now come and meet Richard Menchel. Oh, and by the way, it's another one of my mentors. And Richard says, um, who are you, young man? And I said, my name's Jim Kramer. I, I went to, and he goes, and, and what year are you? And I said, I'm, I'm in second year Harvard Law. And he said, well, what the hell are you doing here? This is business school. I said, I'm crashing it. And he said, well, you can't just crash it. I said, well, I don't know. I'm here, aren't I? And he said, well, you know what? I like that attitude you got to contact Bill Groover. And Bill Groover was the other guy who left me in the closet. Um, but that's how I got to Goldman, was from my crash in the party and knowing that Kate, knowing it was K2 and uh, ready with the Exxon. I love how it all goes full circle. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Everything goes full circle. But it's all about perseverance. Yeah. And never taking no for an answer. Ever. No is, except for, I mean, you know, obviously, socially, you got to, like, no is no. But um, I, I do... In business, no is yes. Awesome. Always. All right. Well, in business only, no is yes. I love yeah, that. Yeah, only in business. The rest of it, no. No, those, whoa, whoa. No is like completely no, like get out of my face. But in business, no. I mean, you know, someone says, nah, Jim, that's not going to work. I'll say, hey, okay, so I see you're giving me some room. And do it fast. It'll really take people by surprise. And suddenly they'll be like, well, wait a second. And say, you know, I, I have a second. I have all the time you want. And then they think, well, okay. And then you say, can I do a project for you? Let me do a project. Now, no one is ever going to say no to someone who wants to do a project for them. It's like TikTok. Here, let me do something for free that's really valuable for you. And I always make it valuable. I always say, here's something. You write it down, you people from the different schools. There's no give. This is, I got my temperature taken. There's no give without a get. Always remember that. There's no give without a get. So if you ask me to do something, you have to understand that there's a get. I'll do something, but this is in the, in the way of, I mean, not now. That, like, this is, that's when you're playing for dinner. Like I said, I don't play for dinner. Uh, but uh, always be ready with a project and always be ready to get the get after the give. No give without a get. Awesome. I cannot believe it, but time is up and I feel like I had a million more questions. Oh, I'm come sure. on. Let's take Phil from Berkeley. <laughs> we, we have 112 questions we did not get to and I'm so sorry to everyone who asked, but Jim. Well, that's okay. I think that we're about to be knocked down by a hurricane. Yeah, exactly. The whole but building's shaking. Is that positive or negative? <laughs> um, I actually, I'm going to quote Olga Sanchez, a student watching, who said, Mr. Kramer, thank you for your honesty. This truly was so transparent and uh, helpful, and, and thank you so much. You think much. so? You think that was true? I don't know. I held back a lot. It was awesome. Big thumbs up. So thank, thank you so you. much for doing this. Thank and you. And stay, stay safe and healthy. You too. All right. Take care, everyone.